lifetime in repeat. All right, so today I'm going to show you how to make a brick breaker game similar to BB Tan. There's a few others on the market that are like it. Um, there's balls and there's a couple other cute ones. Um, BB Tan is the one I'm going to base this on because I think it's one of the better designed ones. Um, you can find this for free on the App Store and on Google Play. Um, it has this kind of neon aesthetic that I think is really cool. Uh, the person who made this, which I'm assuming is probably a really small team, if not only one person, um, has a bunch of other games on the App Store. Uh, under 111% is the name of the developer. So um, I'll just show you how the game works if you haven't already seen it. So you hit play. Um, you start up and some bricks form from the top of the screen. The bricks are always either square or triangular. Um, if they show up in the scene, uh, they have as much health as the level you're on, unless you're on a multiple of 10, in which case some of them will have double health. There's a few power-ups here. Uh, this one will destroy everything, or give one damage to everything in that line for every ball that goes through it. This one gives you a new ball, and this one gives one damage to, in a line to everything up and down. Uh, to launch the ball, you can tap anywhere on the screen and pull, and you get this nice little pointer telling you where you're going, and the pointer's size is relative to how long you've pulled it. Um, I'm going to just go up there, give one damage to everything in the row, and now if I go over here, the plus will give me an extra ball when it lands again. So now I have three balls I can use. So instead of just one ball going, I have three, and the three balls can be separated from each other and act independent of one another. Um, as soon as the balls hit the ground, their momentum is stopped, and then they all go to the place where the first ball landed. So, this is what we're going to make. Now, as far as breaking this down, let's talk about what's in the game. So, on the main screen, I'm drawing this out here. On the main screen, we've got a little bit of ground here where the ball rests, and then the bricks don't start right at the top of the screen. There's a little bit of a buffer because whoever designed this knows that it's really cool when you get your ball up in behind that and it kind of bounces around. So you have these bricks that form. And like I said, there's two kinds of bricks. Um, and the health that they have is related to the level that you're on. So if you're on level one, they have one health. Two, they have two health and so on. Unless it's a multiple of 10. And then they could have, like say it's level 30. They could have 30 health or 60 health, and then the next one is going to have 31 health. And I think that's there just to make a stopgap, uh, to make the game more challenging. We've also got these power-ups. Some power-ups give an extra ball. Some power-ups randomize your shot. And then other power-ups give damage in a row, either left to right or up and down. Um, okay, so let's dive into how we would make this. So we're going to be using Unity 5.6.1. Uh, so go ahead and open up Unity, and we're going to create a new project. Um, okay, if you've already had some some projects here, it'll just tell you what projects you have. We're going to create a new project. Um, we're going to do this in 2D. Uh, don't need Unity Analytics, and I'm going to call this Tactical Brick Break. Uh, okay, and we're going to create the project. Now, one thing that's different between this and the Insult Generation app that I have a tutorial for um, is this one is going to need some art assets outside of what Unity provides. So in order to gain those art assets, um, I would suggest that you go to this guy's website. So Kenny.nl. Um, NL stands for Netherlands, in case you were wondering. This guy, Kenny. Um, I'm assuming that's his name, and I'm assuming it's a guy, who knows? He um, provides free Creative Commons Zero assets. Creative Commons Zero means that you can use them in your game without having to pay him, um, although he does have a Patreon and he has a donate link. So this, again, I'm assuming it's a he. I, this dude seems like he's a really cool guy. So if you click to Game Assets, you can see all these different game assets that he has. You can pay for them. Um, or he has a bunch of assets that are available for free. Um, little sports game, space kit. The space kit's really cool. 
Um, today, we're going to be using um, the physics pack. So I'm just going to type in physics here. You can see I mistyped it earlier today. Um, OK, and then we just want this physics assets. Uh, you can do it with animals if you want. I think that'd be kind of cute, but whatever. Uh, and then go ahead and download this. It's two and a half megabytes. Um, so it doesn't take too long to download, and they're pretty high quality. So, all right, I'll set that down. Now, once you've downloaded it, I saved mine to my desktop. So, here you go. So I've got my physics pack right here. I don't want necessarily all of it. Um, there's a little text document telling you exactly what the license is. I don't want all of it necessarily. Instead, I'm just going to use the PNG folder. So I'm just going to pull PNG into my scene here, uh, and it'll take just a second for Unity to recognize all the assets that are in that. So give it a moment and it'll do that. Once this comes into my scene, I'm going to rename that folder to art because any art that I'm going to use, I'm going to be putting in this folder. So I'll change the name from, oops, from, go back to assets. There we go. I'll change the name from PNG to art. And that's going to be the art for my scene. Um, also, if you guys haven't, if you didn't follow along in my last tutorial, um, your version of Unity might look different than this. For example, if you just downloaded Unity, uh, you might have it in the default view. Um, I don't like using the default view for 2D games because I like to be able to see um, the game tab without having to click back and forth here. I could put my game tab down here. I just like the 2 by 3 split better. Um, so that's what I choose. If you want to change your layout, go up here choose the bar, and then change it to 2 by 3 Also, this defaults to being in free aspect. And what free aspect means is if I change the size of my viewing window here, you can see how the camera changes its proportion, which I don't like, because then I could lay something out in the camera and then change the viewing window, and then everything's all off because the proportion changed. So I'm going to change this to be a phone in portrait mode aspect. To do that, uh, I'm going to click on this bar here that says free aspect. You can see I already have like three of them I've made. So let me just go through how to make a new one. Click the plus sign, call it portrait mode or phone or whatever you want to call it. Changes from fixed resolution to aspect ratio. If it's fixed resolution, it's going to count the number of pixels left and right, and 10 by 10 pixels would be super small. Um, so the aspect ratio for portrait mode is 9 by 16, and then click OK. I'm going to click Cancel because I already have a bunch of them. I don't need to make another one. So I'm just going to click my 9 by 16. Now Unity defaults to this really bad blue color as the background of its camera. So I'm going to change that. I'm going to click the arrow next to Untitled, click on Main Camera, and then these are the options the main camera has. The transform is its position in the scene. Uh, the camera is the stuff having to do with the camera. So I'm going to grab the background here just by clicking that box. I'm going to change my background to white. I know BB10 has a black background, but we're going to make this kind of, I don't know, cute aesthetic for our game. You don't have to if you don't want to. You can make it just black. And there's a few things I'll show you how you can make it look pretty much, very much like BB10. Um, but I want to make this different. So I'm going to go into my art folder here. I'm going to choose, no, oh, no, it's not other I want, it's backgrounds. So I'm going to give uh, a background really quickly here. I'm just going to grab this colored grass, pull this into the scene, and put it as the background. Now, to have this appear behind everything else, I'm going to change its um, transform position. So I'm going to center it at 0, 0, and then I'm going to make its Z position 5. And that puts it. Um, Five away from the center of the scene. Uh, okay, I'm also going to rename this to background. All right, cool. Now uh, I'm going to add some ground to the bottom of the scene here. So I just want to be able to, yep, yeah, our main camera goes right down to there. So I'm just going to add some ground kind of right at the bottom. So to do that, I'm going to go to other and I'm going to grab this grass here. Pull it actually before I do that, let's talk a little bit about the grass itself. So I want this to be 
one unity unit. I want everything in the scene to be one unity unit so it's nice and easy to use. To do that, if I just pull this into the scene right now, you can see that it's, it doesn't quite match up with the unity units there going up and down. It's smaller on both the x and the y axis. I want to make it so that it's exactly one unit. If you look down here, you can see that this is a 70 by 70 uh, image. If I want to make it one unit, then I change the pixels per unit to 70. Um, and I also don't need to have the max size be 2048. My max size, since this is only 70, can be 128, and I'm fine. That way I'm able to encapsulate anything that this would take. Now I'm going to grab this and pull it into the scene. Oh, I didn't apply. So before I do that, I'm going to apply. And now if I pull it into the scene, you can see it takes up exactly one unity unit. So I'm just going to pull this in. I'm going to set it down there. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. On Unity, you can zoom in using the um, scroll wheel. Or if you want to, you can zoom in using the uh, Alt key. Right click and then drag in or drag out. And you can zoom in or out that way if you're using a laptop. It's a little cumbersome to do it that way, but it's something that you can do. So I'm just going to set this so it's a little bit below the camera boundary and a little bit to the side. I'm going to choose change to the mover tool. Um, I'm going to highlight the grass, and then if I hit Command-D on a Mac or Control-D on a Windows computer, you create a copy of that, which, look at that, exactly the same. Now I want this to match up exactly to the one before. So with the Move tool highlighted, if I press V, I can snap to the vertices of this. So I'm going to grab this vertex up here, click and drag, and snap it to that vertex there. And then I'm going to duplicate it again. V, snap to the vertex. Duplicate it again. V, snap to the vertex. I'm just going to do this across the scene really quickly here. Snap to the, oops, there we go. And yeah, there we go. So I've got my little base done down there. If I hit play right now, uh, nothing changes in this scene. Uh, but if I hit maximize, after a beach falls for a little bit. Actually, I don't want to maximize and play. I'll just maximize it now. You can see this looks oh, kind of cute. Um, okay, cool. So now we're going to add our ball into the scene. Actually, before we do that, um, what I'd like to do, my hierarchy over here is already getting kind of cluttered. I've got my main camera, my background, my grass. Um, if I keep adding stuff to the scene, I'm going to have all kinds of stuff over here. And it's going to be difficult for me to find exactly what I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an empty game object that I'm going to keep my level geometry in. So to do that, you can either right click in the hierarchy and choose create empty. You can hit the create button up on top, or you can go to game object up on top and choose create empty. So I just like to right click, create empty. I'm going to call this my ground holder. And then I'm going to put all of my ground inside of it so that all of that takes just one instead of taking so it's just one thing instead of being um, six separate things or seven maybe okay so that simplifies that a little bit uh, I'll leave my background separate just because it's a background uh, okay so now uh, for my ball I'm gonna go into my art folder I'm gonna choose the glass elements and the reason I'm choosing the glass is because we can later overlay this with color and have it look cool and neon, um, like BB Tan does. Or you could choose metal, or wood, or stone, whichever one you want. I'm choosing the glass just because it's going to take a color overlay, overlay really well. So I'm going to grab, is that the only ball that looks really good? Yeah, I'm just going to grab this ball right here. Actually, before I do that, same thing. I want this to be... I want this to actually be less than one unity unit, so I'm going to set this to be 140. I want it to be a fourth of a unity unit. Uh, and then I'm going to set this to be 128. Apply. And then that way the ball is nice and small. Okay, so uh, I'm going to rename this to ball. I'm going to add a few um, physics objects to this because a lot of this game is going to use physics. So 
first thing we're going to add to it is a, if you go to your add component, so I clicked on the ball, click on add component, uh, I'm going to add some physics 2D objects to it. The first thing I'm going to add is something to allow it to collide with other things. So I'm going to add a circle collider 2D. And if you zoom in and I hit edit collider, you can see exactly where that circle collider is, exactly on the outside. I can change that by using this. Do you see how that kind of green box is going in and out? Also with Unity, if you want to change a number, if you put your um, pointer right next to something that's a float or a number or an integer, you can see how it turns into these kind of left and right arrows. So you can just kind of grab it and pull it. So I'm going to leave it as 0.25 though, because that fit perfectly. Um, okay. The next thing I'm going to add to this under physics 2D is a rigid body 2D. Unity doesn't like things moving unless they have a rigid body or a rigid body 2D attached to them. I'm going to set the gravity scale to zero. Now, in order for this to collide to other with other things, I need to have other colliders in the scene. Otherwise, if I hit play right now, it's just going to fall right through because I don't have a collider on the ground. Actually, it won't fall right through because I set the gravity to zero. If I set the gravity to one, you can see it falls right through. Uh, okay. Now, I'm going to add a collider to all of this ground down here. And to do that, I'm just going to click on the ground holder and just add a collider to it. So my component, physics 2D, box collider. Now you can see that that makes a box collider here. I don't want it there, I want it here. So to fix that, I'm gonna click Edit Collider, and I get these little grabby things, and I'm gonna pull them so that they fit the ground. So I'm just gonna pull that over there, pull this down, cool. And now, um, if I change the gravity on the ball to one, and hit play, you can see the ball's gonna actually collide with this. But those won't move, I don't want them to, and because they don't have a rigid body on them. All right, so set the ball's gravity back to zero. Uh, okay, now the other thing that BB Tan has is if you intersect with the sides or the top of the level, then uh, the ball reflects off. So I'm going to add a collider to those. I'm going to do that just through the ground holder as well. Um, the collider I'm going to add for this, I'm going to call it a physics 2D. I'm going to call it an edge collider because I don't have actual objects on the side. I just want it to be the edge. Now, once I add this, if I click Edit Collider, you can see that this created just one little teeny tiny line right there. I want this to follow the edge of the camera. So I'm going to grab the side of it. I'm going to start pulling it up. Now, don't worry, because this looks really short. I'm going to kind of stretch it out like taffy here. All the way up. So I'm going to go a little farther than all the way up. And if you grab somewhere in here, you see how there's like a grabby that shows up, you can create another vertex. So I'm going to create another vertex. Pull it over. While I'm doing this, I'm going to make the background disable just so I can see what I'm doing. Edit Collider again. There we go. Okay. So that goes there. That goes there. And then I want to take this a little bit farther, just so I can make another vertex. And then I'm going to adjust this vertex back down where it's supposed to go. And then this is going to go, oops. This is going to go down here. To undo anything that you did, just hit Control Z. I'm going to unclick Edit Collider and turn my background back on. So what I did there to turn the background off, you see next to the name there's a little check mark. If you uncheck it, it becomes inactive in the scene. So if you ever want to make something inactive, which we'll be doing later, you can just check this little check mark next to the object. So I'm going to turn it back on so I can see it again. Uh, okay, so before I get to scripting the behavior of the ball, there's one more thing I want to add, and that is some materials and I want to add a folder for those materials as well. So I'm going to go to my Assets folder. I'm going to right-click in here. I'm going to create a new folder, and I'm going to call this 
materials. And the material in 2D is something that you attach to an object's collider that governs how it responds when it collides with something else. You can give it friction or bounciness in 2D. Um, so let's take a look here. I'm going to go into the materials folder, right click, create physics material 2D. I'm going to call this ball material. And I want the ball to have no friction, but I want it to have 100% bounciness. This represents how much of a bounce it returns. If you have it set to 1, then if it falls from, say, this height, hits something, it's going to return exactly as high. Um, so this creates this perfectly bouncy ball. You can make this more than 100. You can make it so that it returns 200% of its bounce every time. Uh, that makes things move super fast. So we're just going to set this to 1. Uh, okay, now if we go back to our ball here, there's two ways that you can add this to your ball. You can either grab the material and pull it to where it says none physics material, or you can hit the circle selector next to it, this thing that looks like a nipple, for lack of a better term. Um, you see there's no materials in the scene, but if you click over to assets, you have the ball material that you can choose. And then that assigns the ball material to your ball, which now makes it super bouncy. So if I pull it up here, I'm going to turn gravity back on just so you can see the bounce work. If I hit play, the ball's going to fall after my max done thinking, and it's going to return 100% of its bounce every time. Actually, a little more than 100% it looks like, but anyway, I'm going to move the ball back down to the ground and put its gravity scale back to zero. Uh, okay, so now. Uh, we are ready to start coding the ball's behavior. So we're going to have more than one script in this one. So go to your assets folder. We're going to create a script for our folder so that our assets folder doesn't get too cluttered. So right click, create folder, and we're going to call this scripts. And then inside the scripts folder, I'm going to create a new script, a new C sharp script, which is what we're coding in. And I'm going to call this um, Ball controller. Um, okay, so go ahead and open that up in Mono Develop or Visual Studio if that's what you're using. Uh, and we'll get started coding this thing. Uh, a couple things about how this works. We're going to be coding it so it listens for mouse clicks, but in Unity, um, when you port it to a touch device, it considers a touch to be a mouse click. And that should probably work just fine for what we're doing. If we test it and it doesn't, then we can change it to be specific touch controls if you're on a touch device, and mouse controls if you're on a mouse device. So zoom in really close here. So the first thing we're going to do is create a couple global variables. Um, a global variable is something that appears outside of any method but inside a class. And a global variable can be used by any of the methods inside that class. So the first thing I want to do is I want to create a reference to the ball's ability to move, which is its rigid body. So I'm going to do public rigid body 2D. I'm just going to call it ball for simplicity's sake. Um, now I made this public, which means that I need to remember to assign the rigid body, the ball's rigid body, to this in the editor. Uh, if I don't assign it, then I've created a container but put nothing in it. I could make this private and assign it in the start method, um, which I'll show you doing that probably next time. But for now, we'll just leave it public and assign it in the editor. We're also going to create a couple mouse positions. So um, we're going to create these first, and I'll explain the math behind them. So we're going to create uh, a private, meaning it can't be changed in the editor, vector2, and we'll call this mouse start position. I'm going to create another one, private vector2, we'll call it mouse end position. All right, so on BBTAN, uh, you touch a place on the screen, you can touch anywhere on the screen, and then pull. And then it, so it registers the place where you first touched, which we're going to call the mouse start position, and then it registers the place where you um, released, which is we're going to call the mouse end position. 
Um, okay, and we'll talk about some vector math with those in just a minute. We're also going to create uh, a few booleans. Uh, a boolean is something in programming that can either be true or false. Um, it's named for mathematician George Boole from uh, Great Britain. He worked on something called the difference engine. Uh, don't need to know that. Anyway, we'll make these public just for, for funsies for now. We might need to come back and make them private, but we'll do public bool. Call the first one, did click, public bool. We'll call the next one, did drag. So this is going to check to see whether or not the user clicked, and then if they clicked, whether or not they dragged. And then another one, public bool can interact, which is going to say whether or not you can interact with the ball. OK. Uh, I'm going to create a couple floats here. Um, I'm going to call it, these are going to be private, so they can only be used inside the script itself. So we'll do private float. Now a float is a number that can be positive or negative, and can be decimals or fractions. Uh, there's a couple more restrictions to it having to do with floating point accuracy, but for now, just know that if you want a decimal that can be positive or negative, use a float. Um, and we're going to call this ball velocity on the x-axis, so ball velocity x, and another float, ball velocity y. It's velocity on the y-axis. I'm going to create one more, um, one more global variable here. I know this probably seems like a lot. Uh, and we're going to call this public float. Uh, we want it to be public because we want to be able to change it in the editor if we need to. And we'll call this constant speed. Uh, speed isn't quite the right term for it. It's the magnitude of the velocity, but that'll be good for now. Um, OK, I'm going to save this. I'm going to go back into Unity really quickly. Whenever you start making code, you should stop every so often, even if you haven't done what you think you need to do, just to make sure it compiles and you don't have any errors. So I'm going to click on the ball in the hierarchy. And then I'm going to add the ball controller to that. The ball controller um, wants to know a rigid body, and then these booleans, if they're unchecked, if they're unchecked, they're false. And if I check them, that makes them true. And then constant speed down here. So for the ball's rigid body, I'm going to grab the rigid body here and add it to that. Okay. Um, and I didn't have any errors down here. There's no red. So we're good to keep going. All right, so now I'm not going to be using the start method right now, but we might use it later. So we don't need to delete it right now. That's more of an optimization thing. Uh, I am, however, going to use uh, the update method, but just not yet. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new method that I'm going to call public void mouse clicked. And I'm going to access this method if the user clicks their mouse anywhere on the screen. And I'm going to call this mouse clicked. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to create uh, values for that uh, starting position. So I'm going to do mouse start position equals. And this isn't going to work quite as I have it, but I want to show you what happens. Input dot get actually get mouse position, just mouse position. Okay, so I want the mouse start position, and then I'm going to do something called a debug statement, which allows you to um, see what the program is doing behind the scenes. So debug.log uh, mouse start position. So what's going to happen is um, I'm going to just have it show me what the position of the mouse is. Then in the update method, I'm going to do if input.get mouse button down. Get mouse button down over here. It needs an integer value for the button, either 0 for the left mouse button, 2 for the right mouse button, or 3 for the middle mouse button. Uh, it returns true during the frame the user presses the given mouse button. So it only returns true once. So we're going to do get mouse button down. And then we have to tell it which mouse button. We're going to use 0, which is the left mouse button here. 
We have to put that in parentheses because we're passing a value into it. And then we'll close parentheses from the beginning of the if statement. So what an if statement does is it looks to see if the thing inside is true or false. And if it's true, then it'll execute an, ex ex execute an extra bit of code. If what's inside the if statement is false, then it'll skip it entirely. You might remember from geometry class conditional statements, if then statements, that's what this is. If what's in parentheses is true, then it will do what's in the code in the curly braces after it. If what's in here isn't true, then it won't do what's in the curly braces after it. So what I wanted to do is mouse clicked. And then since I'm calling a method, I have to do open close parentheses, just like there were open close parentheses here. And then end my line with a semicolon. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna save that. I wanna pop back into Unity just to show you what that's gonna do. So it's compiling for a second down here. Okay, cool. Now if I hit play, I'm gonna click around on the scene a little bit here. So 61.2, 121.8, 94, 184. If I click on where the the ball is, it gives me back 69 as the x position, x coordinate, and 29 as the y coordinate. But if I look at the ball, that is not its x and y coordinates. What's actually happening here is, you can see here, um, it's returning which pixel I clicked on. Um, so like if I click in the lower left hand corner, it gets pretty close to zero, zero. If I pick, click, pick in the, or click in the upper right, 134.9, uh, 241. That's telling me which pixel I clicked on, not the coordinate in world space. So I have to do something extra to have it give me the coordinate in world space. So I'm gonna go back to Mono Develop, and instead of just having it give me the mouse's position, which would give me a, if you can see there in the summary, uh, the current mouse position in pixel coordinates, I want it to give me the mouse position in world coordinates, in the coordinates that Unity actually uses. So to do that, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna encapsulate this input dot mouse position and put parentheses around it, and I'm gonna do something to it. And what I'm gonna do to it is I'm going to use the camera to change the um, screen coordinates to the world coordinates. And the way that we do that is camera.main.screen to world point. And it transfer tra this summary transforms the position from screen space into world space. So I'll hit enter and I'm gonna save this. And now if I go back in here into Unity, let it compile for a second. If I click around now, you can see that it's not giving me these huge, see down here, negative 0.9, negative 2.9. 1.1, we're pretty close to 0, 0. All right, negative 0.5, negative 0.9. It's giving me world coordinates now, which is what I wanted. Okay, so I'm gonna go back into Mono Develop. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set did click to true. So uh, what that means is the program now knows that I clicked somewhere. Uh, I'm also going to, up here, uh, change this to, uh, or add another if statement. And now I'm going to look for if input.get mouse button without down. And actually, let me show you the summary of that so you can see. Get mouse button returns whether the given mouse button is held down. So holding down means you're dragging. So we're gonna do input that get mouse button, and we wanna to check to see if they're dragging the left mouse button. So we're gonna use zero. I'm gonna close the parentheses I started there. And then if that's true, then I'm gonna do a new bit of code. And that new bit of code, I'm gonna call, move this up. I'm gonna call public void mouse dragged. Some of you might know that the Unity already has methods for these, but those only work if you're touching a collider. And I want it to work anywhere on the screen, just like that game does. So we're gonna do mouse dragged. Uh, and then for now, I'm just gonna set did drag equals true in here. I'm gonna do more in here later. And this is where we're going to create the angle 
that the arrow was pointing. So I'm just going to add a comment here, and we add comments by doing two slashes, and the comment is going to be, um, we'll call it move the arrow. And if you put two slashes, anything that comes after that, the program just ignores. Okay, so if input get mouse button, then I'm going to do mouse dragged. But I only wanted to do this if it already clicked. So I'm going to add an extra condition to this. And the extra condition is so inside the if statement, but after where I did parentheses, zero parentheses, I'm going to add two and symbols, which means that it's only going to access the then condition if both of the two beginning things are true. So I want it to have did click. So if you just put a Boolean in there, then it's going to check to see if the Boolean is true. You don't have to do did click equals equals true. We can just do did click. Uh, okay. So next, I want what happens when you release the mouse button. So we'll call this public void release mouse. You can call these methods whatever you want to. You can call them Jerry, Tom, Phil. I'm just calling it release mouse so that when I come back to it later, I'll know what it does. So what I'm going to have it do is I'm going to have it, so like you're going to click on the screen, you're going to drag, and so you want to register the point where you clicked and the point where you dragged to. So I'm going to have it first recognize the point that I dragged it to. So mouse end position is equal to, I'm just going to copy this up here. So control C to copy, control V to paste. Okay, then I'm going to do a little bit of vector math here. So before I get into that, let me explain the vector math. All right, so you've got your ball on your screen. Let's get a little closer here so you guys can see this better. So you've got your ball on your screen. Um, let's say that your user clicks here to start, and then they drag to here. So they've created this um, line in between these two points. Now that line I'm going to turn into a right triangle. The reason I'm going to do that is because a vector has a magnitude and a direction. So for the direction, Unity doesn't actually use an angle. Instead, Unity uses uh, an x component and a y component to create the vector. So like, let's say that you drag down two units in this direction and one unit over, so one unit over, then Unity would call this vector one, or the velocity of this, the, the vector, it would call it one comma two, um, rather than finding the angle and the magnitude like you might have done in physics class. Um, so what I'm going to do is I want to find out the difference between these two points on the y-axis. So I want to do difference on y, and then I want to find the difference between these two from here and here on the x-axis, and that's difference x. And then whatever that difference between the two is, that's going to be the x part of the vector and the y part of the vector. Okay. So in order to do that, let's pop back into our script here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that ball velocity x, which is that float I created at the beginning of the script, is equal to, I want it to be equal to mouse start position dot x, and dot x means I'm just taking the x coordinate of it, minus mouse end position dot x. So that's the difference between them on the x-axis. You do the same thing for velocity on the y-axis. Mouse start position dot y. Oops, supposed to be a minus, not equals. Minus, minus, mouse end position dot y. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do next, oh, so one thing about BB10, um, I don't know if you guys noticed or if you played the game before, I want to show you this really quickly here. Um, if they click here and then drag here, you have a really, really small x and y vector. Um, so if we do it just the way I have it now, that ball's going to go super slow. But if you click here and end here, 
They might have the same angle, which means that they go in the same direction, but this one has a larger magnitude, which means this ball is going to go faster. I want it to go the same speed, no matter how long you pull it down. So if you just like grab here, pull there, teeny tiny one, I want it to go the same speed as if you grab here, pull to here, so long as they have the same angle. So to do that, we're gonna do something called normalizing the vector. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm going to create a new vector two. And this vector two is only going to exist in this method, which is why I didn't make it a global. So I'm gonna say vector two, uh, temporary velocity, temp velocity is equal to a new vector two. And that new vector two is made up out of ball velocity x, ball velocity y dot normalized. Normalized means that it takes it and no matter how, so like the camera here, what normalized does is no matter how long this is, it changes it to be one, but it keeps the angle the same. So it would return this having a magnitude of one and it would return this having a magnitude of one. So that if you pull it teeny tiny bit, it's going to have the same magnitude as if you pull it a lot. But one isn't a very high speed. So what I'm gonna do, and that's where that constant speed float that we created earlier comes in, is I'm gonna say that um, ball dot velocity. So remember ball is the reference to the rigid body and velocity is part of the rigid body. So it's equal to, uh, I'm gonna have it be equal to the temporary velocity times the constant speed. So constant speed times temp velocity. And that's gonna make it so that it moves always at a constant speed. We're almost done here. Now, I'm going to um, say that all of the Boolean values I had are gonna be false. So I'm gonna do did click equals false. I'm just gonna do them in the order that I use them to drag equals false. And then this did interact or can interact. This is equal to false too. Can interact is there so that I can um, know whether or not I can actually use the uh, the ball. So I'm actually going to add that can interact so that I, like if it's moving already in the scene, I don't want to be able to add more force to it or have it change direction. So I'm going to add a few extra things to this here. So I'm going to do if input deck mouse button down zero and can interact, then I'm going to uh, do this. And I actually don't need to listen for did click here. I can instead listen for can interact. Then I'm going to create one more if statement down here. If input.get mouse button, this time we're going to use mouse button up, which returns when you release the mouse button. And the mouse button we're listening for is zero. And can interact. Then we're going to go to release mouse. So we'll access all this stuff. And then can interact will be false, which means that you can't click it again until we change the value of can interact. For now, we're gonna be changing that through the editor, but uh, in a minute, we'll change that, not in a minute, next time, we'll change it through code. So I'm gonna go back to Unity. I'm gonna let this compile. Cool. Now, I'm gonna hit play. Now, right now, I won't be able to do anything to the ball because can interact is false. But if I make can interact true, I also have a constant speed of zero. So let me give myself a constant speed of 12. There we go. It's kind of hard to see the ball. So let's make the ball easier to see, which is why I use this glass looking one. So let's go to its sprite renderer. I'm gonna make it, I think blues, I'm gonna make it blue. Um, I'm going to say can interact to true, constant speed to 12, hit play. Mm -hmm. It's going to think for a second. And there we go. So I don't know if you can see that, but if I pull, 
Let's maximize this so you can see it better. That hole just a little. It still goes with a pretty good speed. Whereas if I pull a lot, it'll have the exact same speed. So let's maximize this. If I pull so much, same speed as if I pull a little. So, cool. Um, <clears throat> so that's part one. Next time I'll show you how to uh, make the ball stop when it hits the ground so that it only moves once. Actually, no. Next time I'll show you how to create the arrow so that you can aim the ball. Then, the time after that, I'll show you how to make the ball stop when it hits the ground. So, thank you very much for watching. If you have any comments or problems with what I did, please feel free to comment. I wouldn't hate a like, but if you want to dislike, that's fine too. Thank you very much and have a great day.